Ruben, it's a pleasure. I'm thrilled to talk to you because we come from similar roots. Basically, we came into this city with no business being here. We both started podcasts, and we treated that as a way to build into something better. If somebody is listening to this or watching this, and they want to use media as an entry point to something bigger, how should they architect their strategy? I think it's, a, it's very important to make sure that as you think about media, that you don't think about it as something that you do to get famous. Think about what you know more about in the world than anybody else or what you face more in the world than anybody else, like what pain you've experienced more than anybody else, and talk about that. Because whatever that pain that you have, that you've faced or that you've overcome, is probably something that's shared by millions of people all over the world. And I think audio is, I would argue, kind of the easiest out of like writing and doing video. However, I mean, you can see it right now, video is probably the most powerful. It's the hardest to make, but you could unpack video into audio and into written content. So yeah, that's what I think about first. As a software engineer, your biggest challenge isn't always code. It's using the right tools and processes that help you get the job done. Usually, you have to use separate tools for project management, wikis, and chat. But not anymore. ClickUp is no-code project management software that brings all of your engineering work into one place, and they guarantee to save you one day every week by consolidating your tools. Engineers use ClickUp to collaborate on code, docs, sprints, bug tracking, roadmaps, and chat. It's already used by 200,000 teams in startups like Webflow and enterprises like Google. ClickUp has become the go-to tool for engineers that want to save time and get more done. You can integrate ClickUp deeply with tools like GitHub, Bitbucket, and GitLab to manage your code and projects in the same place. So try coding smarter, not harder, with ClickUp. Try ClickUp for free today at clickup.com sedaily and use code SED to get 30% off unlimited and 15% off business plans. That's clickup.com slash SEDaily. The thing that strikes me about you, Timur and Arthur, the, the three founders of Career Karma, is you guys are fearless. Mm -hmm. And from the first time I met you, I understood that you were fearless and you were going to do what it took to build something significant. How does fearlessness factor into how you have mapped out your entrepreneurship? Yeah, one of the first things that Paul Graham talks about at Y Combinator is the importance of being formidable. You want to have this fire in your eyes, fire in your belly, this confidence that you were chosen to do this thing and nothing's going to get in your way in order to stop it. I think, I think when you hear fearless, a lot of times you just think about a lot of aggression, but it's not necessarily that it's kind of like a endless source of energy. Like I, I like to think about, about, you know, startups don't die when they run out of money. They run, they die when founders run out of energy. And so the reason why picking something that's personal to you and solving a problem that's personal to personal for you is you'll make something that people want make something that people need and nothing's going to get in your way so that that fearlessness will come whenever there's obstacles in the way and you will barrel through it kind of like the juggernaut it'll also create that scar tissue that you need when somebody rejects you and you want to kind of when you pitch someone you want to create a little bit of fear a little bit of fomo of missing out because if they if they say no to you they should feel like you're going to take off and they're going to see you again. And that's happened many, many times in our experience. Fearlessness is one element of entrepreneurship that is easy to think of as it's, it's a cartoon element of entrepreneurship. It's not a real element. It's just a cartoon. It's just something you read about in business adventures or, you know, a book about Amazon or something. 
but it's actually a key component to making it because 99% of the time you're just going to go through extreme difficulty and you, you just can't be afraid. You literally cannot be afraid of what people think. Another characteristic I would consider in this category is loyalty. And that's another thing that resonates with you and the brothers. How have you cultivated loyalty among the people that are close to you? Bay Area is known for many things, including um, some of the most ambitious people that you can network with. I think it's important not to network just to network. The way that I like to operate is to get to know people's stories and do everything that I can to help them without any expectation of return. Once you pour into people that way, you start developing trust, loyalty, love, support, friendship, protection even, uh, to where the value that you have has less to do with material things and the loyalty and the love that you've created in your community. You know that people have your back. And the reason they have your back is because you know that they know that you would take the shirt off the, your back for them and they would do the same for you. You know, part of the reason why we talk about spreading good career karma is right. You like to think about like, what would a world look like if money didn't exist? And how would you support each other and, and hold each other down if, if money didn't exist? And so by pouring into each other, you start creating a lot of like really powerful bonds and, and strong loyalty with each other. Why is that a useful imagination exercise for your business? Because historically, when you think about technology, a lot of the tech that was created was very nice to have, like more like consumer entertainment type driven things. Now technology is moving into more need to have categories like healthcare, education, food, government, things like that. And the reason why this is important is Yes, we want to create a company that's a $100 billion company that makes a lot of money um, so that we can use those resources to keep it free for people and also create like a, a sustainable business. However, because what Career Karma does is serve people to make sure that they match with job training programs that actually get them jobs and that enroll them and, and help them get a career, if we only make money without helping people find jobs in a short amount of time, then it's all a fraud, right? So by creating not just a story, but something that's mission-driven and something that actually connects the world to the next opportunity and solves their problems, you start building loyalty and, and trust with your users. I want to rattle off a few features of Career Karma that impress me. One, your team lands in San Francisco and two out of three of you go to coding boot camps, right? Mm -hmm. And you, your, the, the two brothers who went to coding boot camps found a set of pain points that provided the the bedrock for your intuition, what the career supply chain looks like. And from that intuition, you were basically able to map out a better career pipeline. So that's the level one of the story, which is a profound idea. But then your approach to attacking that market has been very savvy. First of all, the podcast that you had started before you even came on on the idea of career karma has perfect synergy with that with that vision but second of all i think you guys you you did react native right mm -hmm. you like very aggressively bet on react native i would say when the technology was unproven mm -hmm. is that accurate that's accurate yeah why'd you make that bet it's important for us to stay on the cutting edge of things um i was i'll put that on like Arch and Timor staying ahead of things. I know that um, we even played around with like GraphQL and Apollo and like, just we always want to make sure that like we're staying ahead of what's going on. Something that's better answered by Archer and Timor, um, but it's important for us to make sure that we are anticipating what's coming. Like similar to boot camps, we started with boot camps because that's the model that traditional education players are copying. Just like, you know, 
to your point, we have a podcast that we started before Career Karma, but before that, we wrote a blog. We wrote a blog when blogs were like just starting off. People were telling stories there. And then we got into audio before everybody was doing audio. And then we started getting into video before everybody started doing video and got into creating audio rooms in our app before everybody started cloning like social audio into their apps. So you always want to stay ahead of what's going on and have that vision so that you're never falling into this trap of of, of falling behind and, and seeing what's coming next. Was building social, and I, I understand this is probably a better question for Arthur or Timor, but mm-hmm. was building social audio in React Native application, like what was, okay, because I remember talking to you at some point at Peak Clubhouse or maybe seeing you on Twitter and basically saying, we're going to build Clubhouse as a feature into our React Native app, which I thought was quite ambitious, but it looks like you guys just did it very quickly. Yeah, we did it super fast. We have live audio rooms on iPhone, Android, and on the web. So it already exists on the web as well. Um, I know we started off with WebRTC and then we moved into Agora, but um, our roots are in audio. You know, we like you said, we started with the podcast, the Breaking Stars podcast. Before that, before I even moved to Atlanta, I worked in radio in the studio just like this. Our people listen to radio. Our people listen to these types of channels. They want to engage. And we saw that we saw a way to take what we've already built with Career Karma to the next level and it started taking off. It started working very well. If you guys were so familiar with audio, and this is the same, I, I, I had the same, um, uh, miss here but why didn't we see clubhouse why didn't we see that that was where the future was going i think people wanted it to happen i think that's similar to you know email or video or even crypto right i think the early paypal mafia people they wanted to create the internet of money they have a lot of like they talk a lot about like that but they didn't they weren't satoshi right it takes a lot of iteration and playing around with the idea to come up with a concept that takes off amongst individuals. I think part of the reason why Clubhouse took off was there was a very special moment in time, right? March 2020, <laughs> where everybody is stuck at home and has nothing else to do. Yeah, And we're human beings. We are social, right? Education alone is not going to get people a job. And social emotional learning is something that people talk about a lot, which is a tangent. But if you think about people being at home for a long period of time and not being able to interact with each other, trying to search for ways to engage on a deeper level that's not superficial, like on Instagram or Snapchat, and they want to have like intellectual conversation or feel the same type of networking that they used to get when they were in New York or LA or Chicago or Atlanta or, or even the Bay Area. Clubhouse was able to fill that void not just for tech people, but for creatives, for dating, for mental health, for religion, right? All the churches shut down. All right? So they were able to take advantage of that moment. I think that's why, you know, I was I was one of the first 5,000 people on Clubhouse and I was able to see it from test flight all the way into millions of users very quickly. And they did that right. They were able to take advantage of that moment, right? Now that people are not in quarantine, it's a challenge because people's attention is everywhere to keep people focused, right? And if you have broad social audio tools that aren't focused, it's hard to get it to take off. However, you are seeing things like Locker Room that are doing well Focus on sports. Um, you see things like Quilt focus on mental health. You see Career Combo focus on careers, right? So there's, I think, Social audio isn't going anywhere. It's like Instagram stories. I think what's going to take off the most is going to be when it's focused, like dating, like mental health, like religion, things like that. So it's not a meme? Oh, it's not a meme. Oh, it's real. It's a real thing. Okay. I think think a good way to think about it is Clubhouse isn't necessarily the ones that fully made it take off. There's Discord. Discord had voice before. It wasn't the same format as clubhouse but they had chat they had voice and the gaming community has always created really deep intimate relationships using voice i know this because i was a gamer before i played counter-strike 
in the CS 1.5 days on Steam. And I had very deep relationships with people that I've never met before through voice. And I eventually joined a LAN team pre-Twitch um, on the Cyber Amateur Ath the Cyber Athlete Amateur League, Cal Main, right? And our team was called Force, and we finally met in person. It was like we've known each other forever. Just like you have a lot of people that have connected on Clubhouse that are now meeting in real life. So I think that Clubhouse is taking advantage of something that existed already and brought it into light in a way that is easily replicable across different social networks, but they are onto something special. And I think Clubhouse is going to win. Um, but it's, they're not going to be the only player in the space. Twitter Spaces is doing well. Um, everybody's going to do well um, if they if they play it right. I think social audio is just like video. It's just like text. It's just like you know any other medium. And it's up to you on on how you want to use it. You have adopted a let's say vigorous social media personality, and I admire it. Um, you're on display in. A a way that I'm sure positively impacts career karma, positively impacts your social media following. Your most social media following is way bigger than me. I think it comes I've because I've been trying to tweet lately. I've never been a tweeter. I've never I've always been scared. I will be completely honest. I've been scared. Twitter's the shark pool of mm. social media. It's really hard to do well. I feel like a lot of people I know are kind of conflicted about it because okay, so we're kind of at the point where if you're a VC, for example, basically, in many cases, your entire edge has been competed away. On the other hand, if you have a no novel strategy, like this meme VC guy, Turner Novak, you know, he's he's hilarious and he's found out a new strategy where you basically post memes and you can raise a big fund. And basically, if you can drive attention, even in the most ridiculous way, you can, you'll get deal flow and therefore you'll get good deals and therefore you'll, you'll have a positive return. Um, something similar can be said for entrepreneurship. On the other hand, social media can drive you completely insane. How do you prevent yourself from going insane? Our lead investors in this last capital, um, I've known them before and this last capital was a thing. So Gary Tan has an amazing YouTube channel. Kim Mark Cutler was a reporter at TechCrunch before. She's actually the one who introduced us to Matt Panzerino at TechCrunch so that we could publish breaking into startups podcast episodes there. I think it's important to remember that if you don't tell your own stories, other people will tell stories about you. So you can choose to be afraid of the media. You can choose to be indifferent about the media, or you can choose to tell your own narrative and the story that you want to be told. And that's the choice that we've made. Um, but also recognizing that we're not the storytellers for everybody. We need, to, we need to create a platform that enables people to tell their own stories. In my opinion, the purpose of technology is to give people a voice, the power to create, and the power to organize. The reason why this is important to understand is because historically, because of the way journalism works and the way media works, people speak on behalf of others when it's not exactly always true. And so for the first time in history, people are in a position to where they can speak for themselves about what's going on. For example, rather than just going to the website of a school or looking at the advertising that someone's talking about, you can speak with the school directly in our live audio room. You can speak with the student today about what their experience is like. You can speak to a graduate that got employed or didn't get employed because the best source of truth is the individual that's going through it. That's why Twitter's so powerful. Twitter does have shark energy. It can be that way, but you can actually have positive experiences on Twitter as well. I think that if you are going to start thinking about storytelling, it shouldn't be just doubling down on one platform. Like I get a lot of people talk a lot about LinkedIn. LinkedIn, I get a lot of people paying attention to what I post on LinkedIn. But TikTok is something that people got to figure out. But I think that, you know, part of the reason why we, we work with like uh, a Gary Chan is because they're masters in, in uh, initialized capital. So they're masters of media. You know, even SoftBank, who's one of our investors. You know, when I did the Univision interview, um, the, the Spanish network, that was through Marcelo, uh, who's, who's on the board of Univision. And he connected us to that. And 
we they understand the power of media as well. You know, as a CEO, one of your number one jobs is being the storyteller. And so that's what I'm supposed to do. And so that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. TikTok is the only social media app that scared me. I, I don't want to even have it on my phone because it's too too good. It's wild, yeah. I don't even understand it yet. TikTok is something I haven't really dipped my toes too deeply in. Have you tried scrolling it before? Yeah, it should is very addicting. It's really good. <laughs> it's really good, and it gives me a sense that culture is basically hit the singularity. If you go onto TikTok, you see the cultural singularity. You see culture moving faster than you can keep up with it. That's a very good point. Faster than you keep, can keep up with it. And that's what scares me about it. Like, I think to be really good at something, it requires like deep focus. And if things are always moving so fast where you don't spend time focusing deeply on it, it's very hard to learn anything. And I think this is what, this is something that was hard on me during the pandemic. You're sitting there at home, you've got the smartphone, it's the most addictive thing in the room, you've got nowhere to go, you're, you're flipping between social media like it's you're, you know, channel surfing. Nothing's going on. Everybody else is at home. It's just if the pandemic, you know how you know how the Great Depression had these people who after the 1920s could never spend money because they were just afraid. Mm -hmm. Like they were just they had they had lost all their money during the Great Depression for the rest of their lives. They were just afraid of that happening again. So they always saved money. They never invested, never mm -hmm. spent on anything. If the pandemic was our equivalent of that, what do you think are the long-term neuroses that we're going to have. I'll talk about so silver linings that I think came out of the pandemic. I think it focused people on what really matters, right? Like health, family, friends, love. Like at, at the end of the day, like those are like the building blocks that like really matter. And what it did for me, like when the gyms were shutting down, it kind of forced you to not just go out, like either go outside or train indoors, but also not be reliant on workout buddies if you wanted to stay in shape. It could have had the opposite effect. In the beginning of quarantine, definitely had the opposite effect. It like, I lost, I went completely out of shape and I just like ate food all day and just like didn't work out and didn't know how to train at home. But at some point, like something started to give and I was like, okay, how can I get back, get out of this funk and start training? So just going back to that focus on health. I think the other thing that it started to do is like, it started to get me to focus on speaking with my family more. I never really checked in with my family as much as I do now out of the habit that was developed from the momentum. So from the pandemic, every Sabbath, we actually did a Zoom call and we still do it now. And we create like Zoom, uh, WhatsApp groups. And um, we have a family reunion happening right now that we're tapping into just leveraging this technology that we never did before. And I'm way more in touch with my family than I was pre-pandemic. And I think that's that's really exciting things. The other thing that I think is cool about the pandemic is it started making me think about what are the old school things that people did in order to entertain themselves, right? Started playing a lot of board games, right? Started figuring out how to appreciate nature, how to go outside, you know, things like that. And so that's how I got into Catan. Right, and started playing a lot of Catan um, and discovering that you don't need to always be plugged into the internet and figuring out how to have that deep focus. I started listening to a lot of audio books, which brought me back to my childhood because my mother used to always play underbridged audio books for us to read. But going to, to the long-term effects, even though a lot of businesses were shut down because of the pandemic, companies were forced to go online. Schools billions of students were forced to go online and all the excuses or all the rhetoric around it's impossible to do remote work or it's impossible to do online learning went away because tech had a great year and is having an even bigger year this year now that things are going away but technology is what kept the world going i think companies have a choice they have to choose to either be fully remote forever, be a hybrid, whether you have online and offline, or bring everybody back to the office. You're seeing a lot of people that are making the decision to just force everybody back to the office, get a lot of heat. I know a lot of my colleagues 
that actually had their businesses shut down, not because they weren't making revenue, they were making millions of tens of millions of dollars, but their leases shut their company down, which is part of the reason why some people might be asking people to come back to work to leverage these things. But during the pandemic, like it it it, it had a factor. So I think remote work is gonna be a thing. I think online education is harder for K through twelve, but for adults, it's definitely not going away. If anything, it's better because there's over fifty five million Americans that filed for unemployment during the pandemic. A lot of women that were affected, a lot of parents. So not only did they were they able to get access to training online, but also um, they were able to get access to training that was flexible for them as well. Again, education alone doesn't get people jobs. And so you also have to start thinking about the social aspects of education, especially for adults. That's one of the biggest benefits of college is the social side of things. One of the scary things that I think is happening um, and I don't have a clear opinion on this yet, um, is you're starting to see people delay marriage longer and the birth rate's falling. And I think that's actually going to be a big factor for the U.S. and the, and the, and the job market and things like that. You can learn as much fancy theory as you want, but at the end of the day, machine learning is still 90% data cleaning and infrastructure work. And doing it all manually is exhausting. It's not likely to make its way to production, especially when your data, your models, and your code are constantly changing. Pachyderm is an easy-to-use ML ops platform that empowers anyone to build scalable end-to-end -end machine learning workflows, regardless of whatever language or framework they're built on. Pachyderm provides Git-like data versioning and lineage to automatically track every data change and final output result, meaning you'll also know exactly what data was used to build that latest model automatically. Right now, SE Daily listeners can get over $400 in credits on Pachyderm Hub. Sign up today and build production-grade data science workflows in minutes without ever having to configure a single piece of infrastructure. Imagine being able to automate your entire data science workflow and still reproduce any result from any point in seconds with complete confidence. Head over to pachyderm.com slash sedaily to get over $400 in free credits. But you want to hurry because this offer only lasts for a limited time. That's pachyderm.com slash sedaily. P-A-C-H-Y-D-E-R-M dot com slash sedaily. Demand for on-prem software remains enormous. It continues to grow and it's not going away. Take advantage of the automation, reliability patterns, and primitives provided by Kubernetes for not only your applications, but also in how your on-prem and multi-prem apps are delivered and managed. Kubernetes and other cloud-native technologies have led the way to modernizing on-prem software delivery. It no longer has to be a tarball and a 150-page manual. Go to replicated.com slash sedaily to learn how Replicated can help you modernize your on-prem software delivery strategy. If you're a software vendor looking to modernize your application delivery and management to gain more enterprise adoption, check out replicated.com slash sedaily. Replicated gives software vendors a container-based platform for easily deploying cloud-native applications inside customers' environments to provide greater security and control. So check out replicated.com slash sedaily and learn how to deliver and manage your software through all kinds of methods. Bare metal servers, cloud VPC, GovCloud, even air-gapped. There's a secure way that your customers can use your application without ever having to send data outside of their control. And Replicated is already trusted by noteworthy customers like HashiCorp, CircleCI, and SNCC. Go to replicated.com slash sedaily to get a free 21-day trial of the full Replicated platform. You said a lot of interesting stuff there, but Catan. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't like Catan. And Get I'll tell out of you here. I'll tell you why I don't like Catan. <laughs> I'll play it, you know, if it's Catan or Solitaire. But Catan, if you mess up at the beginning of the game, you're gonna be sitting there doing nothing for thirty minutes. You just lose. False. 
False. False. So there's not that much variance in Geese. So this because the critique you often hear if of, of when I hear people critique Catan is that it has too much variance, particularly in the in the setup and the. I think the variance is what makes it amazing. Like I would argue, what you just described is more of like a characteristic of Monopoly, right? If you don't have the best properties on the board that have the highest probability, then like it's going to be very hard to win. But with Catan, you can actually win even if you have not the greatest setup in the beginning i like the way like everybody has you have to everybody sets up clockwise and then counterclockwise so it's pretty equitable even if you mess up with your first placement of your settlement and your road in the beginning you still have an opportunity to go twice at the end or like to catch up if you didn't if you miss something um, but even if that didn't work out there's so many different elements that allow you to win. And I like that it's a barter economy. It's not, it's, there's no money in it. It's yeah. all, it's good. That's it's, true. It's, it's, and that's, that goes back to the thing about a right. world that exists with no money and like what were societies like in the beginning. I, I used to play Civilization growing up. So I don't know if you remember Civilization. Yeah, um, Zuckerberg's and, favorite game. Yeah, Civilization's amazing. Um, I used to play Age of Empires, Command and Conquer, SimCity, StarCraft, WarCraft, Catan, or Catan is literally the board game version of that to me. You think so? Oh, yeah. So much more complexity and autonomy in those games, though. For sure. It's def those are definitely more complex, but it's like the old school pre-computer version of it. Or I guess it came after computers, but I don't know how Catan is. Yeah, I suppose since Catan is a multiplayer game, it's not just a heads-up game, you want the turns to be reasonably quick, so you can't have the complexity be too high because you can't be sitting there pondering your turn for too long. You ever play Catan with the people who take forever to negotiate? They're asking everybody around the table, "Hey, I got a sheep. Yeah, I'm looking for three lumber." I don't. You're I don't like, like playing with people that I'm don't know how to play. Sorry, like that. there is <laughs> like. I mean, there's a reason why Reed Hoffman says it's the most entrepreneurial of board games. He thinks Catan is the most entrepreneurial board game. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. he's gone on public record about this. Um, there's some people that even like. For like higher level hires, like executive hires, they'll actually play games just to see how you think strategically. Um, but I've done a lot of research on Catan. It's pretty interesting. Have you played Netrunner? I have not. I'm Net, down. Net Netrunner is the Netrunner is the hardest the hardest one. It's the hardest game. It's too complicated. I'm down to try it. I'll I'll play you sometime. Let's do it's, it. It's Let's difficult. Do it. It's Let's difficult. It. I've played it a lot in college. I'm really into these types of games. Are they, you a Dominion person? You played Dominion? I have not played Dominion. Okay, Dominion is a good one. I just started getting into this stuff. My brother, so my brother did a boot camp as well. But the way he got his job after um, App Academy is actually um, by going to these board game nights that Salesforce and other people were hosting. Even though he's an engineer now, he still plays a lot of board games through that. And my family got really into it. I taught my whole family how to play. And we got this thing called Tabletop Simulator. So we we play board games online as a family too on the weekends. Great bonding exercise. Great bonding exercise. You a poker player? No, but I want to get into it. I know a lot of people play poker here, but I want to learn. My 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 friend Kahan, who's the one who introduced me to Katan, he's a big poker player. So yeah. You know, I grew up playing poker with Hasib, right? I didn't know that. Yeah, Thanks. dude, so I met you guys I, are pros. I met I met Hasib <laughs> I met Hasib on a poker stars table. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. So you're on another level of poker. <laughs> I'm not on Hasib's level. Uh -huh. There's a reason Hasib is the best crypto investor. Oh yeah, that guy's taken off since his boot camp. <laughs> um, what do you think makes his way of thinking about the world different than other people? One of my favorite things about Hasib's personal philosophy is his thoughts on effective altruism. Has he talked to you about that? Mm -hmm. I think a lot about like that about effective altruism is it's not just about philanthropy and just like giving people bags of rice that they're dependent on right you want to you know i think i forget the the quote i'm going to slaughter it but it says like charity is injurious if it doesn't create independence from what's being given to them i think it's a rockefeller quote and giving things to people without teaching them to fish is actually bad so you kind of like want to enable people to like get to the next level. So with Hasib, what I really like about him is like, hey, I'm a high power guy. This is like him. I'm, I'm Hasib talking, not Ruben talking. I'm a high power, ambitious person. 
and I believe in myself so I can do anything. However, is that the way I can make the most impact? No. So how can I make two of me or three of me or four of me by pouring into multiple people, either financially, educationally, or whatever? And that's why I think a lot about career karma and why he inspires, inspires me a lot. Because human potential is one of the biggest untapped resources. Like the ultimate mission isn't just helping a billion people get jobs by matching them to boot camps and getting them to be engineers and designers and data scientists. Like getting you to make money and do what you love is important. What the ultimate thing is like helping people realize their full potential and figure out what their their calling and what their purpose is. So you don't think effective altruism is virtue signaling? No, I don't. Okay, I don't think so either. I don't. I, at least in Hasib's case, I don't think so. I don't, I don't. I think philanthropy needs a lot of innovation. And I think that effective altruism is in the going in the right direction. It's not like this, this white knight savior type of thing. Yeah. Watching Hasib, and, and I played poker with Hasib, um, and I know how good he was at the game. And I remember talking to him about it. And I remember talking, I remember talking to him about it when I was, um, I was 19 or 20 and he was 17, I think. And just realizing I probably was never going to be at the top. And that's why I'm glad I'm not like all in on venture, for example, because venture is, is pretty hard to differentiate yourself unless you're as good as Sequoia or, you know, in the angel category, you're as good as Gary Tan or whatever. Um, you know, your money is as good as anybody else's. In entrepreneurship, at least you get to like, you could be the worst, you could be the worst Jeff Meyerson in the world. You're still the only Jeff Meyerson. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I mean, what I love about Hasib is he knows he's good, but he is so humble. He's so humble. And I think that, like, you'll notice that with, like, some of the greatest people. There's definitely, like, arrogant, great, talented people. But, like, a Muhammad Ali, like, Trey Young. No, Trey Young is, is great. But, like, if you, I don't know if you saw the game that he just did against the Bucks. I don't know who Trey Young is. He's, he's on the Hawks. Okay. Um, but, like, the way that they speak has a, a level of humility. A lot of the greatest jujitsu fighters that are, like, right. that are black belts will still be in the fundamentals class teaching you the basic moves. Sometimes they like, it's not even about the belt. They won't even like flash their belts and talk about how good they are and all their war stories. It's just, they're willing to just teach and help. And did you get humility from your upbringing or from getting beaten down by entrepreneurship and, or, all myself. I mean, you worked at, huh? Myself. All, Go all yourself. All yourself. Okay. I mean, you 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 went through the corporate. You went through the same corporate. You guys. This is another thing I like about you guys. Is you guys went through the same progression I did, where you went into the traditional corporate route, and you realize, okay, this this is not working. I've been humbled by life. I'll be honest with you. I um I always knew that I was gonna be great, and I've always been talented at a lot of things, like with music and things like that. But the problem with things like that is. It's kind of a curse. Like, I wasn't as disciplined as I am now growing up. For example, with music, because I perform better than a lot of my colleagues, I did not focus on my music theory classes, and I regret that. I didn't focus on my oral theory, theory classes, and I regret that because I was a little cocky, a little arrogant. There's times where the work that I put in in order to reach a certain level got me there, but then once I achieved a certain level financially, I like stopped going as hard as I used to. This was like in my 20s. And like something happened to me that humbled me. And I had to like lick my wounds and re realize that like it's bigger than me, all right? What I'm doing right now is not for me. Like I truly believe that I was chosen to do this type of work. And as soon as you start getting, like start doing things for yourself, and not doing things for others, life will humble you, in my opinion. I think my 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 current perspective comes from being smacked in the face a bunch of times by life. In your defense, music pedagogy is basically where, or I think when you were going through music pedagogy, it was basically where 
programming classes were before coding boot camps, mm. mm -hmm. which is to say archaic and terrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm super passionate about music. I don't want to look at sheet music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to memorize some song that Mozart wrote. Mm -hmm. What? What would career karma for music look like? That's actually a good question. So there, there are people that are trying to take an approach to teach people how to learn instruments online. Like my brother, for example, he taught himself how to play guitar very well through YouTube. For cello and violin, historically, I would say is impossible coming from being a music teacher. But now being in tech, I actually think there are ways to figure this out. Um, so it's kind of like saying, I can teach you jujitsu online, right? Historically, I would say it's impossible until I discovered Gracie University, which is pretty interesting how they figured out how to train people to be MMA fighters online. So the, I started off with the Suzuki method in cello, where before, you know, people thought that you just had to be a prodigy. And if you're a prodigy, then I will teach you to be a great musician. And only, and you have to be born with that quality. Suzuki Method's philosophy is every child can. So I don't care who you are, I can teach you. And ideally you start as early as possible because as a child, you soak in things better. And similar to boot camps, the mindset is to create an environment where you're soaking in the information and you're focusing on the practical thing of just making songs that you can recognize versus learning the theory immediately. Kind of like not focusing on like data structures, algorithms, and the CS theory. A boot camp is going to teach you exactly what companies need. Suzuki, in the beginning, you're going to be playing the music so you hear it all the time. So that when you're learning a piece, they're going to teach you the string names, A, D, G, C, right? They're going to teach you the addresses of each thing in per, in first position, like one on A, two on A, three on A, all right? So like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, right? If you play it wrong, you'll know that it's wrong because you know what it's supposed to sound like. And over time, you'll learn the theory as you progress and you're surrounded by other people that are doing this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the answer to what this career karma for music look like is, if there's training programs that exist to teach people how to play music, then we can match you to those training programs. And I think Suzuki is a good method for it. Mm. I have my own thoughts about the issues with music schools. The issue with music school is they don't focus as much on the business side of things. Oh. Yeah. And I think that part of that is because sometimes people view business as diluting the art but the thing about music is once you achieve a certain level of success you're forced to become your own brand mm. so you have to master business or you're going to get screwed up that's why you have so many artists in messed up contracts because they don't know business and you have so many starving artists because they don't understand concepts like a thousand true fans. If you want to make a living as an artist, you need a thousand true fans. A true fan to find as someone that spends a hundred dollars on your product, mm. whether it's going to a show, buying merch, whatever. All right, people don't think like that. So they like I have a friend here in San Francisco who has been struggling during the pandemic, who organizes monthly events. I'm um, in the city for musicians, but during the pandemic, everything shut down, and he thought that everything was not going to happen for the rest of the year. And then I told him about this thing that I went to yesterday or two days ago about Chopin Nocturnes by Candlelight and how they were charging 55 a ticket and there was like 200 people there right now. And they have it programming all the way through the end of the year. And they're like, what, that's possible? How do they get the word out? How do they do this? How do they do that? As I said, study them. So I think career comp for boot camps would have music schools that also understand booth, uh, business. Let's say I'm the head of people at Google. Mm -hmm. I am watching the price of an engineer go up and up and up and up. 
I'm seeing savvier negotiators. I'm seeing the best talent in my company drain away. I need to architect a five-year plan for getting my hiring pipeline future-proof. What do I do? That's a great question. Really great question. You know what? Let's not say Google. What's a better uh, example? Any, it's just any company. Yeah. I think any company. I really like that example. I'm going to give a big shout out to my friend, Garrett Lord. He runs Handshake. He's the CEO of Handshake. So he's crushing it with university recruiting, entry-level recruiting, early talent career networks. So like every major large company has a entry-level recruiting strategy to attract talent from colleges all over the world. I think that's not going away. That's going to continue to happen. However, a lot of companies also hire a lot of contractors, a lot of gig workers, a lot of warehouse people that are in jobs that, you know, people talk about, you know, rising up through the mailroom where you can actually like focus on like janitorial or security jobs or cafeteria jobs that are technically people that work for the company and have their foot in the door, but they're not actually like doing that deeper technical knowledge work. Historically, you know, people, and even currently, the reason why a lot of people look for employment is because they want an employer to pay for healthcare. And I think that's gonna continue to happen because that's important. But part of the reason why that started is because people worked in factories. Right? Going back to that point about remote work and knowledge work, now that co companies are making over 200 million jobs, that's jobs available online, I think companies can take a stance and invest in developing talent. So there's a, a number called 5250 uh, where employers are able to provide tuition reimbursement um, for their talent. And many companies cover that amount for their employees. And I like what Guild Education is doing where they're working with like Walmart and Chipotle to invest in frontline workers so that they can uh, not just be a, a retail worker, they can get paid for college so they can go forward. I think if every company wanted to start thinking about the five-year plan, they will start thinking about um, how to invest in talent that's outside of the university pipeline that would be for their early talent career and figure out how to fund their training. For example, um, in the gig economy, you have millions of drivers that are black and brown, that are adults, that work really hard that understand the tech company, probably more than the engineers themselves because they're actually drivers, that can listen to podcasts, right? Right. that can receive insight from the employer, right? What if you like, you offer career comm as, you know, this resource to all these people and you can literally pay for the training for these individuals and then hire them at the end, all right? Now you have a source of talent that's diverse, that knows the product better than you, that can fill in the roles that are similar to university recruiting. And I think that like you can do that for all kinds of roles. And it doesn't just have to be gig economy jobs. It's just all these jobs that like you're gonna, I think employers are gonna have to take a stance and start stepping in for their, not just entry level recruiting, but even their current talent. You know, part of the reason why talent moves from company to company so much in tech is partly because of culture Right, But if you want people to stay in a company for a very long period of time, you want to have very clear trajectories and really good challenges for them and ways to invest in them so that they're constantly growing. And that's why you have organizations like Reforge and um, On Deck that have companies paying for training for their current employees. And so long story short, I think employers need to take an active role in paying for education and developing the talent that already works for them in lower level roles. When I worked at Amazon, the very first day there was an orientation 
And one of the sessions in orientation was led by a guy who had been at Amazon for 10 years. He started in a warehouse and he worked his way up to being in charge of a technology department, in charge of hundreds of people. Uh And that's similar to what you're saying with the Uber driver, Uh where there should be a roadmap to to getting from being an Uber driver to being an employee of Uber. And that's actually why people underestimate Uber and Lyft as companies. They don't understand that they're workplace platforms. They haven't looked at Winolo. Have you looked at Winolo? I love Winolo. Winolo is a great company. It's amazing. Yeah, low key, powerful marketplace. Huge. Sequoia. Um, <laughs> Sequoia, of course. I actually found, I interviewed them. And the way I found them is I was, one of the ways I find companies to interview is I just look through the venture firms mm-hmm. and just like find the best companies to interview. And I just, I was like, what is this Winolo thing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. Very cool. Um, okay, so that was inspiring when I was sitting there in orientation listening to this guy talk about how he moved up from the warehouse. And I was like, cool, the American dream is still alive. And then after eight months at Google, or sorry, at Amazon, I, I just, you know, you and I grew up in the age of the Borg, right? Um, when I was going to school, I would go to the career fair and like, Everybody was talking about, did you get the interview at Google? Did you get the interview at Amazon? Did you get the interview at Facebook? Which Borg are you going to go to? doesn't really matter. You're going to be working on a Java monolith in any case. Um, you know, you're going to be tinkering on the Borg, and you're, you're excited about that. And you better be excited about that, because that's all there is. You're going to the Borg, and you're going to like it. And, you know, Stripe is like the ultimate Borg. It's ultra Borg. Is that the future? Do, like... In, in the people you're seeing in Career Karma, do they want to go to the Borgs? Immediately, high level, I would say yes, right? When you look at like Fang, that's like the GMs of our generation, GMs, Fords of our generation, where like massive companies like Facebook, Apple, Netflix, for the people that don't know, you know, Google, that hire people and they're, they're they're the most visible this is why media is important but the people in career karma have historically not known that there's so many other companies like winolo and others that exist that they could work for that are aligned with their passions right going back to their story and what they've been through right if you grew up as a cyclist or as a runner right or as someone that like grew up in the outdoors you can work for companies like All Trails or Strava that are aligned with your passions. And like, then then work doesn't feel like work. You're just doing what you love. If you love pets, right? You can work for companies that are focused on taking care of pets, right? If you grew up in so on and so forth, right? Any any Pick anything, right? Clothing, Stitch Fix, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then work feels like play. People in career come are initially trying to like solve a problem related to financials like their their base needs to be able to take care of their families but there's also a lot of people that want that are like tired of their old jobs and they're looking for something that's more fulfilling and i think a very good way to do that is not just figure out which companies exist that are aligned with their personal passions and their interests or their their struggles that they've lived but also identifying other people that are like them that are in those places for example If I have historically worked at companies that are predominantly men and I'm a woman, I would love to have a list of companies that have a lot of women that are like me. Let's say I'm a mom. Like and I can imagine if I could show you a list of companies in San Francisco by level of concentration of mothers. That'd be kinda cool. That would make me want to work there. But if I could show you a list of companies by level of concentration of runners or sports fans or Giants fans or hometown, right? I'm in San Francisco, but like, where are all the people from Atlanta and the Bay Area? Like, at the end of the day, like, if you're paying me the same, if you're paying me competitively, um, if the company is doing well and it's well-funded, the founders are, are like, pretty legit, what's going to make me want to work somewhere? It's a lot of these types of things that we're talking about here. Exit opportunities are important. Part of the reason why people talk about the Borg or they talk about like working in investment banking or private equity, all these other things is because of the prestige. But there's like, you know, go to YC Universe. You can see like a lot of YC companies that have the prestige, that have the brand that you can bet your career on. You can look at Wealthfront's list of companies to start launch a career. You can look at the breakout list of companies that you can bet your career on. However, 
is that what you were called to do? Who are you becoming through all this doing? And a lot of people are asking themselves, who am I becoming through what I'm doing? And is that person who I was called to do? Is that person, is that future person like closer to their purpose? I know that's kind of deep, but I, th- I, th- I like to think a lot about like the, the fact that there's a difference between a job and a career and a calling. Phase one of people in career come is just finding a job. Which is what you're focused on right now. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's a way to architect a company culture that is Borg resistant, like that allows you to scale and not, I mean, or is there a way to, I mean, you mentioned your, you basically mentioned you're Jewish, right? You, cause you mentioned the Sabbath earlier, right? I mean, are, are, my, co-founders culture, are, culture, my co-founders are Jewish. I'm Seventh-day Adventist, but yeah, I keep the Sabbath, okay. which is pretty much the Christian version of Judaism. Right. What I saw at Amazon was religious. It was a religious experience. Being at Amazon for eight months, even only eight months, was a religious indoctrination. And, and I mean that in, in the most generous, complimentary yeah. way. I felt like I was a part of something, a part of something very significant. Um, I would get to Amazon at 5.30 in the morning, 6 in the morning. Like I would wake up, I would wake up at 4.30 a.m. I couldn't get back to sleep. I would mm-hmm. just be like thinking about what it would be like to just go and walk around the offices. And since I had a key card, I could do that. Mm-hmm. So I would just go to the Amazon campus. It's still dark outside. Just like walk around. I would just, I would bring a Kindle and I would sit in an empty cushioned chair somewhere deep in the heart of Amazon and just read. And That's just, the magic. It was magical because it was just thinking. And sometimes I'd bring paperback books that I bought on Amazon. And it was really ironic because I was just thinking like, how the hell do I get out of this place? Like, mm-hmm. it, this is really cool. Like I'm reading on an Amazon device in an Amazon building. I know a lot of people at these big companies like feel this like sense of unease. Like, you know, I'm buried in random service X in, that's that's a part of this behemoth. And nobody around me is asking questions. They've been working here for years. You know, I I feel a deep sense of existential dread, but I'll just ignore it. You know, I, I, I don't know. This, this is actually one of the things that I, like, I started this podcast to, to kind of investigate is, like, what is that, like, malaise of the, of the knowledge worker? And, like... Yeah, I don't, I don't think you have to, like, resist the Borg, right? I don't think that, like all big companies are evil, right? I don't think that. I think it's cool to be in a company or a nonprofit or a church community or a sports community where you're so fired up, like you're drawing the Nike symbol and saying, just do it. You know, you are drawing your favorite superhero character or you're putting up the bat symbol and because you have hope or like your child is like dressing up like Black Panther because they're inspired by seeing Chadwick Boseman, I repeat, like stuff like that, right? I don't see anything wrong with like dreaming. However, I think what you're touching on is how do you keep your edge and not like lose yourself in all of that? So when I when I think about this... You mean like on a company level or on a personal level or what? On a personal level. Personal level. On a personal level. Like how do you attend, how do you attend the Borg for a few years exactly. without losing yourself? Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, there's really good books like The Startup of You. I love that book. Right? There's good books like The Sovereign Individual. Haven't right? read that one. Um, Alliances. Another good one. Right. The, the Alliance, you mean. The Alliance, yeah. Right. Where they talk about just like, I really like Startup of You and like Alliance. Startup of You is so good. Like, because it's, it's like the whole Reed Hoffman philosophy type things too, where like, where if you think and about- And Ben Kaznoka. And Ben Kasnoka, yeah. yeah, wasn't he at, at at LinkedIn as well? Uh, well, he was he was Reed Hoffman's chief of staff. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, and now he's doing Village Global. Exactly with Eric Thornburg. Shout out to them, All right? That's the homies. Like, and so what's what's cool about it is, speaking of the knowledge worker and just labor markets today, is I like the thing about it related to sports. It's like back in the day, if you grew up in a certain neighborhood, where'd you grow up? Austin, Texas. Texas, right? If you if you grew up in Texas, like, you know, I guess it's not Austin, but you play, let's say you play for the Mavericks and you play for the Mavericks your whole life, right? You play for whatever team forever and you become the hometown hero. These days, it's not like Michael Jordan playing for the Bulls forever, right? It's you play for one team for a while and you die hard with that team. Like 
You're going to put on the ga- the Cavs, like, jersey, everything. Like, you're going to go to Miami, win some rings there. You're going to go to Lakers, like LeBron, you're going to win some rings there. And that's okay. You're not losing your identity. At the end of the day, you're still LeBron. Free agency has been introduced into the labor market where these tours of duties, which is what they talk about in the Alliance, exists. So I think going back to the original point, like thing in this conversation about stories and media, right? A lot of people are saying how every company is a media company, but every individual is a media company, right? What is your story? You have to ask yourself, like, what was I put on this earth to do? You're not going to fully figure it out in the beginning. You may never figure it out. But you always want to constantly strive to figure out if you're on that path and identify what skill sets or experiences or people you need to meet, um, live, do to become or to reach that purpose. If I'm going to be in the board for a while, there might be something I'm optimizing for. What are you optimizing for in that phase of life? Right? Is it to learn what it's like to work in a corporate environment, which I would argue there is some value to that. Is it to learn how to deal with messed up politics? <laughs> Sometimes, right? Is it to get a lot of money fast for a while while you're figuring out your next thing? Is it to have something comfortable so you can work on your side project at night until that side project makes enough money so you can quit your job and start a company? Is it so you can meet your co-founder? That's how I met my co-founders in investment banking. So you have to, every, you have to move fast with intention. And the intention is to find your calling that leads to your purpose. And if you always stay true to that, you will never lose yourself. If you get caught up in material things, like I want the most money as possible. I want to have the house. I want to have the car. I want to have all these things. It's very easy to get lost. I think there's Borg done right. And I don't think we have it yet. So when I was at Amazon, the whole time I'm there, I'm like, okay, how does this thing work? Like, Mm -hmm. what the hell's going on here? And, you know, you read the Everything Store. You walk around, great book. You walk around the Amazon buildings. You just try to, you try to think back to the garage, right? They're selling the books in the garage. And then that's, they induct on that. And then they basically get to, they own South Lake Union in Seattle and, are expanding and they have the spheres and everything. And you can, when you're walking around the Amazon campus and you're seeing all the different areas and you're seeing the whiteboards and the contents of the whiteboard and you're seeing the leadership principles everywhere and you're seeing the internal email chains and you're seeing the internal badge system that you get, you know, for being rewarded with your Amazon devotion. And you see all these things that compose the Borg culture of Amazon. You see the ways that they are able to extract the most innovative ideas from the smartest people in the company and make those people believe that they're getting adequately compensated for those ideas. You see how to institutionalize that. And eventually you say, okay, I get it. I don't want to be a part of this. This is not, this is not the system I want to be a part of. And then you get out and you start seeing the external world and you start to see startups you start to see the maturation process from the founder point of view you start to see the systemization of the startup through y combinator the strategic systemization it becomes more of a definitive process for how you get to borg scale it becomes demystified the founders become less of a deity, right? I mean, you look at the best founders these days. I assume you're not looking at them like deities. You're looking at them like there's a guy or a girl who made a very smart series of strategic decisions, who managed to avoid pitfalls, who managed to get up when they fell down, and they were persistent, and that got them to where they are today. And it's deterministic, and they're not a deity. And if it's deterministic, and if you're an entrepreneur then you should be thinking from day one, what do I do when I get to Borg? What do I do when I get to Borg scale? How am I arranging that? I'll ask you and then I'll go. What, what, what do you do? When, if you, if you do get to Borg scale, what's the, what's the sustainable way of doing that? How do you avoid becoming one of these companies that gets really big and then some internal rot happens 
some cultural shift happens, right? I love Stripe. I will still call Stripe a Borg because that's what they're becoming. And they're going to need to, to reinvent their culture in order to avoid in, in order to avoid cultural stagnation because they have they have enabled entrepreneurship at a scale that their current culture probably can't sustain because all the best employees are going to be like, well, I could what I can build on Stripe Connect and I don't have to work at Stripe. I'm going to go do that. What's cool about like working at these big organizations that started like Stripe did in the beginning or like Amazon, I like that you use the Amazon analogy because our head of community, her name's Shanaz. We talk a lot about our work at Career Karma where we have software, like you talked about. We have an app, we have a website, um, but there's a lot of things that we do manually as well, like the whole doing things that don't scale type of thing before we code it up, right? So we, we like to test things manually before we apply code to it. And we say that's putting books into boxes, very similar to like, Amazon, like you, like that level of humil humility, where like no work is beneath you, and like from the CEO all the way down to the the I don't like saying this, but like the lo the lowest level of employee is willing to put books into boxes. Very important to like recognize that there's a lot of powerful things that you learn, like the memos at Amazon. It's very good things to learn about um, reading. Um, just all these different things that are like r like positive things that you can take with you anywhere. To your point about deities and founders, like, yeah, when I first came to Silicon Valley, like, the founders and the investors, especially by the media, were, like, painted as gods and celebrities. What I love about YC and just being in the batch and just, like, seeing, meeting these people, like, Stripe founders and Airbnb founders, like, you meet them and, like, you're right, they're remarkable, ambitious people. But when you see them and you hear their stories, you're like, wow, they're just like me. I can do this. Like, you can do it. Oh, I could definitely do this. They just have to, like, follow the fundamentals and, like, stick to it and, you know, keep iterating and blah, blah, blah. Stripe, they talk about the Collison effect, right? Early on, he would literally go to developers and, like, give them a laptop to install Stripe. Collison install. The Collison install, right? They're known for that. Right, and that's probably something that shaped their culture to get them to where they are today. I think once you start getting to their level, this is why even at our level, it's very, 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 very important to ground yourself in guiding principles or company values and mission statements that you actually live and you hire and fire by. I got that from Tony Shea at Zappos, RIP, right? Where, um, you know, we, we bucket our guiding principles into how we act, how we decide, how we win. Um, and it's very important for us to like make sure that that's instilled. And the way to, as you're growing your organization, even when you're doing performance reviews, making sure that those things are, are incorporated, I think a lot about a book that's called The Starfish and the Spider. Have you heard of it? Nope. It's called The Starfish and the Spider, The Unstoppable Power of leaderless organizations, mm. right? Where it talks about if you attack a spider at its head, which would be like the founders, it dies, right? But if you split a starfish in, in half, it creates two starfish. So how do you take your company from just like a founder-driven culture to a mindset, to an idea? Because ideas are bulletproof. That's a view from Vendetta. Right. Haven't seen it. You haven't seen V for Vendetta? Anyway, it's okay. You haven't played Dominion? You're right. There you go. Good at touche. All right. <laughs> so so what's cool about what's cool about it, it's kinda like Alcoholics Anonymous, right? So people came up with these principles that help people create habits to break free from being an alcoholic. And then that idea was taken on by so many other people and it's like really powerful thing. It's like religion, right? It's like um, you killed Christ and you th and accidentally created a new religion. It's kind of like anything. Like sometimes people try to attack the leader and it sparks a whole nother thing. When you're building an organization, if you want to keep that that um, that energy or that like day one energy, like Amazon is always day one, you have to figure out how to keep people dreaming. And 
to be honest with you, I don't know because I'm not at that stage yet. But it's something I think about a lot. And it's part of the reason why I hired a head of people so early. Shout out to Jessica Lamb. Because, you know, these people understand not just how to hire people and recruit. They understand industrial psychology and how to really shape an organization that has the qualities that we're talking about right now. So long story short, I would check out that book. And there's another version of it where there's like the spider the starfish but then there's hybrid organizations that have some hierarchy but at the same time it has this like anybody can rise they use examples of the apaches and part of the reason why it was so hard to take down the apaches is because if you talk took down a leader somebody else will rise up how do you create an environment where people could be promoted from within there's some redundancy within certain departments and so on and so forth how did take someone that like may not be fully qualified for something, but they can rise up and step in in certain areas. It's, it's, it's challenging, um, but it's fun. And I think that um, it's possible to do. One of the reasons I think about this a lot is so much money coming into the system, right? So much money. And what that means is if you've got a decent pedigree, if you can put together a decent pitch deck, if you've got a decent idea, you can raise some money. There's lots of ways to do it. You just have to pound the pavement, find some money. So it's easier than ever for people to leave companies. There's still a fear there. We could come back to fearlessness. Um, there's also plenty of people who are in visa situations or in family situations where um, it just makes more sense to stay at a company and, and all due respect to those people. But there are a lot of people who are at these big companies and they have a position, they, they're in a position where they can leave. They can start the search for an idea, et cetera. But talking more uh, ho holistically, are these rational capital markets? No. <laughs> Why not? Um, I think human beings are inherently irrational because we have emotions. We're not like logic. People make decisions based off of how they feel. That doesn't mean that your feelings can't lead you in the right direction. But people make decisions based off of how they feel most of the time versus just objective things. Like the quality of a product. It, like a lot of a lot of clothing is sold just by how it makes you feel. The quality of the shirt may not matter. It's just how it makes you feel. When it comes to like being f scared of talent leaving your organization, I think another thing that's starting to happen is like founders are also not viewing talent necessarily as theirs, right? You're mine. You work for me. It's like more like we're working for each other at this moment in time. I'm going to pour into you. You're going to pour into me. And if you ever decide to make a move, you have my blessing. And maybe I'll give you something along the way. Jack Altman, who's one of our angels, who's the founder of Lattice, from what I understand, he has that where publicly he'll say, like, if you start your own company, I'll, I'll cut you a check. You see a lot of CEOs do that for talented employees that leave and those companies take off and still provide that good career karma for their organization, <laughs> uh <-huh>. right? <laughs> I, see what you, I see what you did there. Yeah, I did that, uh, which can help out, right? That's not a bad thing. So I wouldn't be too afraid about that. And then as far as like even being worried about people stepping out on their own to start a startup, starting a startup is hard. I know Muhammad Yunus has a great, essay talking from the Grameen Bank has a great essay talking about how all human beings are entrepreneurs but I personally would argue that most people aren't built to be entrepreneurs I think everyone is capable of being an entrepreneur but with that said do you want to make the decision to be absolutely obsessed and to have a maniacal drive to like sacrifice so much time to never be satisfied with the milestone you achieve today, which was already impossible or like unimaginable before you're always having to like break yourself to the next level to get to the next goal, to the next goal, to the next goal. A lot of people don't have that type of stamina, even though they're capable and even though that can be developed. And so you have to decide on what you want in life. Some people want to have families. Some like sometimes the level of work that, I mean, a lot of times the level of work that it takes to start a startup will destroy families. It's possible to have a family. 
you're seeing a lot of amazing examples of entrepreneurs that have families while they're running companies too. But like, you gotta be borderline insane to will something into existence that most people don't believe is possible. That whole or, or or just or just hate the idea of anything else. Yeah, exactly. You have to be driven in a different kind of way, and you have to be. It's kind of like Noah in the Bible, right? I, I'm using this example because if people don't know the story of Noah, right? Like Noah looked absolutely crazy until it started raining. The story of the Bible is like it's like there was an ark, mm. big old ark they had to build, and he was preaching for a hundred years that it's gonna rain is that the story 100 years over 100 years oh, okay. and everybody is like this dude is psycho uh -huh. it's gonna rain everybody get on the boat get on the boat get on the boat finally get on the boat door shuts with all the animals in there that starts raining everybody starts trying to bang on the door so they don't get wiped away and i i, I like that example because a perfect example of like the patience and the and the faith that's required to believe in the inevitable. Boot camps, skills-based education, alternative forms of education, like reskilling is inevitable. It's gonna happen. Everybody doesn't see it yet, it's gonna happen. So you have to bet on this thing and just go after it. When I was talking about 375 million people switching careers between now and 2030 instead of going back to college to choose their next jobs because of AI, not a lot of people were rocking with that message when I was in demo day. <laughs> now everybody is like, oh my gosh, how did you know about boot camps? Right. Right. Yota Scale is a leading cloud cost management solution designed uniquely for engineers to make smart cloud cost decisions with smarter attributions and smarter analysis. With Yoda Scale, you get a complete view of your cloud infrastructure spend, including containers and Kubernetes, 95% cost attribution accuracy, actionable recommendations, and continuous cost anomaly detection. You get team-based alerts via Microsoft Teams and Slack to prevent monthly bill shocks, and machine learning-based projections with predictive analysis and budget alerts for teams, products, and applications. Yota Scale is widely adopted by some of the best engineering teams in the world, including Zoom, Hulu, and Compass, who depend on Yota Scale to help them save up to 50% on their cloud costs. Request a demo and find out how Yota Scale can empower your engineering teams today. Visit yotascale.com slash demo. That's yotascale.com slash demo. Stack Overflow for Teams brings the power of Stack Overflow to your company. It's an easy-to-use, flexible platform that helps thousands of developers answer questions and make progress in their work. Features in Stack Overflow for Teams include robust search functionality so that you can easily benefit from the questions and answers documented on your team. Surface the most important information about onboarding, the development lifecycle, feature releases, and more. Stack Overflow for Teams saves users time and it powers up the workday by clearing the obstacles caused by unanswered questions. Try it now. Create a free team at stackoverflow.com slash teams slash se daily. That's stackoverflow.com slash teams slash se daily. You guys were underestimated in a hilarious way. Oh, yeah. I saw... I Look, if I would have had money, I would have invested. Yeah. You know, we, we were both kind of, you know, on the ground floor at the same time, just sort of like, yeah, nobody's believing in us. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's funny how that happens. Um, okay. And, and, and we've been talking about a lot of different things. We definitely have to talk a little bit more about your product because i'm sure people listening like don't really know what your product is as i understand it it's where you started at least was middleware between people applying to boot camps and the boot camps themselves and you basically said 
we're going to help you find the right boot camp and we're also going to connect you with a bunch of boot camp people who are going through the exact same process as you they're going to be going through the exact same struggles in imposter syndrome so you're basically saying we're going to solve imposter syndrome and solve the boot camp higher admissions process um and in doing so you're cre- you create a gate between these boot camp attendees and the boot camps themselves so you get to take a vig from a very high margin set of businesses which are the boot camps which gives you like an incredible beachhead not to mention data advantage and interesting anyway just give the give the platform pitch that's a great breakdown i really like the way that you shared it um what i'll add before that is just like how we discovered it where we started off with a podcast, the Breaking Stars podcast, and the way that we discovered that a lot of people pay money to get people into their schools is a boot camp wanted to pay us five thousand dollars a month to get access to our podcast audience. Right? You have sponsors for this podcast, right? And we're like, wow, schools pay to get access to students. Interesting. Do trade schools do this? Do colleges do this? And we realized that there's billions of dollars that were out there to get people into schools. The problem is, is like we didn't want to charge users. So like to your, you, what everything that you explained is perfect. Where career karma is the easiest way to find a job training program online. We match workers to job training programs like boot camps. We our directory also has trade schools and colleges so that they could get high paying jobs in three to twelve months. We offer six different career paths, software engineering, design, data science, data analytics, cybersecurity, and tech sales. And anytime we match someone to a school, we get a fee that we use to keep free for people because boot camps already cost around ten to $50,000, but cheaper than college. And we also use that money to create live audio rooms inside of Career Karma. It's kind of like Discord and Clubhouse. Is that expensive, baby. by the way? Is, a bootcamp is Agora is Agora expensive? Running the running the chat the the audio system. It works. It's, it's not. It's not as you scale. Like it gets more expensive, but it's it's cost effective. Okay. It's cost effective. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But when you say paying for audio rooms, I mean you're basically you're you're talking more about the engineering and design work that goes. Into I'm that, talking right? about how we don't make money just to make money and just pocket it. We reinvest back into right. our community right. to give them more resources. So I think it's very important to understand. You, you, don't, that. you don't have to answer this, but are you guys making enough money to pay for your engineering staff at this point? Your engineering oh, yeah. management. Yeah. yeah, you guys are killing it, aren't you? We're crushing right now. Yeah, we're very good. Yeah, we're doing very well. So strategically, do you use that as leverage to raise more money, or do you just go into like build mode? There'll be more some major announcements Ooh, soon. All right. But yeah. For sure, we're, like we want to help, we want to create a tiger global. We, we want to create a hundred billion dollar company, right? All right. You know, so we want to help a billion people in the next ten years. Like our biggest cost is talent. So did you go through the process where the the modern growth investors compete to see who can stuff the most money down your throat? Did you? I don't know. I'd love what to hear I, what about I, what that. What I went through the process of is building an awesome team. I know that. That are creating amazing software that are matching workers to school. But schools. seriously, what's it like these days being on the receiving end of those emails from the investors that all want to get into your deal? It feels good. It feels good. I mean, I think what's cool about... Validation or does is it fleeting? Is it, like, is it significant validation or is it fleeting just like everything else? It feels good to like have evidence that your, pro- that your idea is working for yourself, right? It's not investors coming to you. That doesn't give you validation. The fact that like your community is growing, the revenue is growing, the retention curves are looking nice, the weekly active users are looking nice, the NPS scores are looking nice, right? That's validation. Like people getting jobs, people getting enrolled in schools, that's validation. It is nice also to have a lot of inbounds after announcing in December and being in the position that we're in. But I think it's very, very, very important to call out that there is a difference between raising money and making money. You talked about the cost of Agora and things like that. Like Our cost, again, is not necessarily the software. That's the beautiful thing about yeah. software. It makes things cheaper. Yeah. All right? That's why we keep things free for people. 
we believe in investing in our people. I want to create the best team in the world that the tech world has ever seen. If I went through the list of people that we've hired on our team, I get goosebumps. It's, I'm I'm so excited about it. So like when what as we raise capital is to continue investing in our people, con- continue investing in our pro- product, continue investing in our users, and expanding options for them, right? More career paths, more school options, and other things like that. You so, have any trouble sleeping these days? Yeah, yeah. How do you calm yourself down? I wouldn't say it's anxiety. It's I, yeah, I don't excitement. mean that. I mean it's, it's excitement. It's excitement. I know. I know. Yeah, that's a good question. Like, I think that's what especially it is. now that it's the Roaring Twenties, dude. I think I think that's what it is. Like, Roaring Twenties is keeping me up. I'm so there's so many opportunities. Yeah, there's so many things to read. There's like so many things I want to do. Yeah, like I feel more alive. Right. Than I ever have. Right. I feel in better shape than I ever have. Yeah. Does it feel too? Good? It feels too good to be true, though, right? It feels like a dream sometimes. It feels like a dream. Um, it's also cool when like the people that you've hired are excited to be at work too. Mm. Everything feels surreal. It's like relationships, right? If you're in a good relationship, which I'm not in a relationship <laughs> right now, <laughs> <Makes two of laughs> but, but if you're us. in a good relationship, it should feel like, oh my gosh, like, am I dreaming? Like right. this is amazing, right? Right. right. And like that's how it feels like at work. But where does it all go? And you don't want that to happen. You, you don't want that to happen. Don't want that to happen. You don't want that to happen. Like you have to keep that energy up all the time. And um Because once it's gone, you can't fix it. Once it's gone, you can't fix it. All right. I think about that a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh how do I calm myself down? I watch anime. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I watch a lot of anime. I before run. bed? Yeah, before bed. It's usually I'll get on a on a call with my brother. Cause my brother's the one who got me into anime. And we'll, it's kind of nerdy, but we'll get on a Zoom call. Uh, we'll put our headphones in, and then we'll literally start the anime at the same time, mm. and we'll watch it together mm. online. We update our anime list, and it's like brother bonding time. So, yeah. So we do that. I do a lot of running. I want to, like, starting in August, I'm going to get into swimming. Okay. So that's the next thing, and then I'm going to get into cycling, because if I'm doing all this running, I might as well get into triathlon stuff. This is a good city to do it. So... Running is like moving meditation. Because I think to your point, I have a lot of energy and I have to get it out. Yeah. And even after I work out, I like still am on fire. Right. So yeah. that's why like I started doing, like getting back into jujitsu again. Jujitsu is a 10-year yeah. journey, right? Mm-hmm. To be a black belt. So I want to be a black belt by 2030. By the time I'm there, then career karma will be at least like, I don't know, five, 10 billion. We'll see. You know? So that would be cool. Black belt and billion dollar company, you know? I also like spend time thinking a lot about spirituality and God, right? So the Sabbath, right? I um do music. Um, this Saturday I'm gonna be with my my friend Scott Moss, who's another YC founder. Uh, we're working with him on some pretty cool things with Career Karma. He's also a boot camp grad, high school dropout, but one of the best engineers in the world. We're just gonna do a play date, and I have no kids, but I'm gonna be with. Do you compose? I don't. My brother composes. I I play well. But I'm not a composer. You guys send me send me some stems. I will. I will. I will. So that's something that I've been talking about. I'll show about. you what I can do. That'd be great. One of my good friends, Kevin Alusla. Um, we talk a lot about music a lot. So yeah, music. What does that mean? When you t- when you talk about music, you're talking about other people's music, you're talking about composition, you're talking about artists. What are you talking about? Kevin's a big artist. He's in a group called Pentatonics. He's one of my best friends. I was just at his house. We talk a lot about music, future collaborations, things like that. Mostly his music that he's working on. Mm. Um, and then the thoughts that I have related to music. Just so you know what I think about related to music and like my future thoughts about music. I don't think I was given the gift of music for no reason. A lot of musicians start off in music, get big in music, realize that music isn't a very big industry. Um, and then they get into other forms of business. I'm doing the opposite where get big in tech, get big, like very like wealthy pretty much. Right. And then... Start a record label after, or something. Start a like record that. label, <laughs> or like, A and R. Yeah, fund musicians like like the Medici family, right? The Medici family like funded all these artists, like Da Vinci, Michelangelo, all these people like that, and like really did a lot with artists. And I want to be able to like be a big patron of the arts while also being an artist myself. Will you listen to my new album? I just came out with an album. Of course, 
Of course I will. Okay. That'd be great. I'll like you know, it. like Steve Aoki and his family. Like, yeah. And like his Benny Hanna family have a business. Boom, big artist. Like there's a lot of there's a way to do it another way, similar to like how Arthur Timor and I took the approach to before getting into career karma. Mm-hmm. Look at the Wu Tang Clan. Wu Tang Clan started off as a super super group, split up, all created big albums, right? At different record labels, became very famous. Still around today. You know, we're like a backwards version of the Wu Tang Clan. When we first moved to tech, we all worked at separate companies, came back together, created Career Karma, which is not just a company. It's a mindset, it's a movement that's going to help a billion people in the next 10 years. You know what hasn't been done in the music industry is running a record label like a software company. Yeah. Like, I'm sure you've, you've, you know what a digital audio workstation is, right? Yeah. It's like, very complicated piece of software mm-hmm. should be managed like a piece of software should it, a music company if you're trying to produce good music you should run it like a software company because the digital auto workstation is at the center of it mm-hmm. this is what i think is the weak point in the music industry is like there are people that take it like seriously but i feel like there is a more regimented approach that you could take to music production i don't know why spotify hasn't done this yet or maybe yeah, they're i was doing... thinking about that so- spotify is in the best position to do something like this did you see do you know the company sound better that they acquired Mm-mm. there's a company called sound better it's basically a dedicated marketplace for producers, singers, songwriters. It's it's Fiverr, but only for music stuff. Interesting. And they acquired it. They acquired it when it was basically a janky Rails app Smart. with giant marketplace, like very very good marketplace. I've used it. Super good product. But yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't. Spotify should start a record label. They they could easily make or break artists because they have their own distribution on a lot. Right, that's the whole point of the DJ, the whole point of all these other things, right? Like they can do a lot of things. Is it too adversarial though? Because you know how, like, if oh, you're... it'll 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 cause a lot of controversy if that happens. <laughs> like Netflix can make their own movies. It's like not as adversarial, not as zero sum. No, those kind of thrown down the gauntlet too. I don't think you can do that if you're Spotify. I think you overplay your hand. I think if you try to go into music creation, you're overplaying your hand because that's the long game. You always get there. The long game. You always get there eventually. Why do it now? You know, why overplay? Why tip your hand? You know, why make enemies? Sometimes the mindset is if you're eventually going to do it, why don't you just do it now? Kind of like opportunistic hires, right? We got a couple of those that just, like once you start creating a talent magnet, you start attracting hires that you didn't really expect would be at your table this soon. And even though you didn't plan for it, if it's part of your long-term plan, sometimes it's better to get them in-house early. Right. So if you're inevitably going to get there, sometimes start now. And you don't always have to do it in an explicit way. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, somebody told me that Spotify is doing this. Oh, I'm, I wouldn't just, be they surprised if they it. haven't done they it. They hide it behind it. It's like shell companies yes. and labels and yes. stuff like that. Like, may, who knows? Maybe Doja Cat is like a Spotify artist. That's how you stay ahead. Yeah. It's like, I mean, Trust, we got long-term plays on deck, too. <laughs> There's lots of things coming. Presumably, no pun intended, presumably you're not going to make an on-deck style career crop. Okay. No, nah, nah, we we'll, we never plan on starting our own school. The way to think about career crop is like, you know, boot camps come and go, colleges come and go, trade schools come and go, but career crop is forever, right? We're, we're agnostic to which training program you're going to go to as long as they have an outcome of getting you a job or your desired thing that you need in your career and we'll make sure that you are able to find the right training for where you're at uh, but you can think about it's more like an index on the future of work versus like you're, you're not going to create a monopoly in education right one school is not going to train the whole world just like one hospital is not going to heal the world right? how's your uh, post boot camp retention that's not our focus yet but it is something. So part of the reason why we started Audio Rooms is to focus on that. Is that important? Is post boot camp retention important? I guess it yeah. is. It must no, be important. No, it is. It is. So you know the series. I mean, cause, cause, no, no, no. You're right. So the Series A story was we are going to focus on matching people to schools and get really good at this admissions layer. Our premise, though, like when you think about the ten year, how do we help a billion people in the next ten years? Is people change careers five or more times in their lifetime. So, but there's no platform or 
or a career center that guides them beyond that first job or even after they're enrolled in a school, to your point. So we need to build a platform that keeps them engaged after they're enrolled in school into their first jobs and stays in touch with them forever. So part of our next chapter will have that story included as well and how we retain them post mm. boot camp, mm. which is why we have the live audio rooms. So you, every day you could go into CareerCom, you see um, schools hosting live audio rooms, students hosting live audio rooms, companies hosting live audio rooms, uh, nonprofits like Dev Color hosting live audio rooms to really stay engaged. Um, and you're going to see how that, that plays out in the future. Why do they host live audio rooms on Career Karma and not Clubhouse? Because we're focused on careers. Mm. Like there's a lot of other elements that when you do it, when when you do things that are broad, it's hard to include the features that are specific to the labor market. So, you know, with Career Karma, if I'm hosting something about school and I want to get information about the school and I can like press a button to get information about the school, that's great. Like Clubhouse is not going to just like introduce a get information about a school button or an apply to a company button type of thing, right? We basically hinted at this and I think it's something that we're probably both dealing with amidst the inevitable, um, you know, ups and downs of business and relationships and finances and pandemics we are working to build systems of resilience in ourselves and um that's a a progression for um for fitness and health and diet and um this is something i want to talk to you about like i think both of us have played entrepreneurship like an endurance sport that's the approach you want to take. You don't want to have expectations about anything happening tomorrow. You want to make sure that something happens in five years. That's right. That's right. I love every the way you phrase all of this about like approaching entrepreneurship is like an endurance sport, um, persistence of resilience within ourselves. These things are really important because some of the dark side of the pandemic is like, you know, the mental health issues that came about of things like depression, suicide even, you know, lack of employment causes a lot of things. Loss of sense of identity of who you are. I think something that's also happening as a result of like free agency in the labor market is also like who am I? Because if you're if you historically you could be like, I'm an accountant. But if you're if you have multiple jobs in your life, how who are you now? If you if you tie yourself worth to what you do. I think psychology is becoming more and more important as people think about breakthroughs in career navigation. I also think that because tech is moving so fast, we talked about like things like TikTok and things like that, being able to focus on things for long periods of time, or at least 30 minutes at a time, is going to be important because you got to learn how to learn. You can't just go to school for four years and then never learn anymore and just work forever if you want to stay relevant, if you want to stay ahead and know what's coming. And so I think that for me personally, um, and for Archer and Timor, and for people in the community, we talk a lot about habit building. That's why in the early days of career comedy, you saw all these people tweeting about the 21 day CK challenge. That's still in there. It's like 21 days to make a habit, right? So like, what are the what are the habits? You guys are so good at making fetch happen. <laughs> yeah, it, it works. It works, you know. And like, how do you create these habits that turn into to like twenty one days to make a habit, ninety days to make it sticky? So for me, during the pandemic, all right, since I didn't have a gym, and once I got fed up about like becoming overweight or whatever, I started running. I could barely run a half mile in November. It's now what June. And I've run over 300 miles. I can easily run very long distances, but it comes through like this habit building um, and being consistent with these types of things. And I think that um, I think that this era, something else that happened that was like really cool was software being introduced into the fitness game, not with just Strava, oh, yeah. but just Garmin, Future Fitbit, Fit. Future Fit, Apple Watch, Levels, um, Whoop like all these things um, and it being included into smartphones and wearables and things like that. And I think what's cool about that is we're starting to get into this quantified self, like addiction to wanting to see yeah. progress. Historically, 
if you just look in the mirror, you get very discouraged if you don't see progress. Right. But if you can see the progress on the phone yeah. or on the watch or on the whatever, then like that keeps you motivated. And so we really want to figure out how we take these different things that you can learn from the fitness industry and apply it to a career transition so that as you're going through a career transition, learning a new skill, where it's very easy to doubt yourself if you try to code something and it's just as error all over the place, you still have a way to know that you're making progress. And so um, we have amazing product managers like Elizabeth, Dan, and Melvin, and, and others that are, are building out our product in that regard, um, and, and a bunch of other things that are happening. So, yeah. You and I have both talked about the the David Goggins, Jocko mm -hmm. class of people, um, and uh, those guys are, are pretty interesting. To me, they're really valuable stand-ins for what a human can do in a certain direction. I've gone through various times where I've, I've really tried to emulate them a lot. I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up that early. I can do that. I can get up that early. I can do that many setups. I kind of gave up on it and just and just realized, like, you know, I think I'm going to treat these guys as a certain ideal in a certain direction of, of a certain kind of life. But I think I'm going to wake up and go have a cup of coffee and sit there while I scroll TikTok on my iPhone. And I think I'm going to be okay with that. What standard do you have to hold yourself to, especially since you're a leader of a really big community? I think that Can't Hurt Me book really changed my life by David Goggins. It helped me realize what I was capable of that I didn't realize I was capable of. Um, he had this, after listening to his audio book, he had the the 4 by 4 by 48 challenge that for the people that don't know, it's like you run four miles every four hours for 48 hours to do 48 miles. And I did 53 in less than 48 hours. And... That was in March. And before that, like, the longest I'd ever run was 13 miles. I did that in a weekend, which was more than I had run in the entire month of February. And I was like, man, like, I really have no excuses. I, I really, like, a lot of people talk about how they don't have time to do things. So you don't have to make the choice to just, like, be a savage. You don't have to wake up at 5 a.m. every day. You don't have to, you know, go to the gym all the time and have a six pack and all these things. But like, I think you do have to recognize that you're making too many excuses. And there is time and there is a way to do whatever you want to do. And I think you do have to acknowledge that you have way more potential than you even realize. And I think you do have to believe in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else is going to believe in you. The approach that David Goggins and um, Jacko have to life is a approach that is not going to resonate with most people. It's going to turn some people off, especially on the communication style. It resonates with me because I like the light kicking the behind type of thing, the punch in the mouth type of thing, the do something that sucks every day type of thing. But you got to recognize like what like Nipsey and all these other people say, like is that a comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing ever grows there. So if you want to grow, you have to do something that sucks every day. So let's say I start getting good at running. Let's say I, I do like get good at like just something that's like impressive, like cello. I have to break the cycle and do something else. Like, swimming or cycling or fighting or something that like continues to like push me to the next level or some variation of cello. Like I play classical cello, now do jazz. I, I'm not a great jazz cellist, by the way. How do you challenge yourself more at this thing? Like if I'm a good individual sales contributor, how do we become a good sales manager? Not all I see are great sales managers. So how do you push yourself? And you're not pushing yourself because you're competing with the rest of the world. You're not competing with yourself because you want to be celebrated with all these trophies. All those things feel good. You have to do these things for yourself. And this it goes back to that spiritual side of thing. It goes back, it, even if you don't believe in God, right? Just like, ask yourself, why are you here? Why are you on this earth? What were you put on this earth to do? To your point, sometimes you do got to stop and smell the roses and drink the coffee. But 
most of the time if you want to get anywhere even if you have smaller goals you have to push yourself out of your comfort zone that's the only way to make progress if not you're just maintaining if you want to coast for your whole life that's great but people are living till 150 these days we haven't seen that person yet but i think we're going to see that and so like if people are living until 150 years old that means they're going to be working longer and 50 is the new 30. So what are you doing with your life? Like, are you just going to travel and play golf forever? I'm not saying that's not important. It's not important to have fun. But, like, work, people talk about this, like, work-life balance type of thing because they don't love what they do. We're all blessed with sp spiritual gifts. And if you are doing work that you feel like you're called to do, that you love, it doesn't feel like work. Yes, it's a challenge, and yes, there will always be problems. Yes, there will be frustrating, but it's good challenges. It's yeah, like trouble falling asleep. Yeah, it's like heavier weights. It's hard, but like you feel good after. Yeah. Name one person that like went through a hard workout and after they didn't feel better. Let's close on a story. What's the best story that's come out of the Career Karma community? One of my favorite stories recently, her name is Lanice. Uh, she's a teacher. She was one of our, in our, one of our early squads, the Young and Ambitious Squads, uh, started by Sydney, um, who's in Stockton. So uh, Lanice is in New York. Uh, she signed up for a boot camp called Flatiron School. She's a teacher. Uh, she also started off as one of our career coaches. Uh, she did a part-time boot camp, was struggling in the job search, and we launched live audio rooms. And I told her, hey, you should join this live audio room with a guy named Scott Moss, which is the guy I'm going to hang out with this weekend. Scott was talking about his job at Netflix and things like that. And then she sent them a personal message inside of the Career Karma app after. They ended up speaking with each other. And then within a month, she got a job making $100,000 at Newzilla, uh, which is a ed tech company, um, and absolutely crushing it. And what's super cool about that is... She's very well spoken. She has a, a awesome like story of like overcoming a lot of challenges. Uh, but recently, um, I got invited to speak at the ASUG SV Summit in San Diego um, in August, and we're uh, flying her out to speak on the panel. Hmm. And she's also invited tons of new people to the Career Common Network to follow her same footsteps. So that's one of my favorite recent examples. Well, let's close on that. Yeah. Ruben, this has been awesome. Yeah, thank you, man. This has been great. I love to see how the the podcast has evolved over time. Um, and anything that we can do to help, just let us know. Thanks, man.